Erica, what's up? Welcome back to the podcast. I don't know how many times it's been, maybe like four or five, but I was super excited for this conversation um, because when you posted that article to my Facebook group, I think it was last week about ACL uh, risk and how we're, you know, blaming all the wrong things and not really taking personal responsibility. After I read it, I was like, all right, let's go deeper on this on the podcast. So I'm looking forward to it. And thanks for coming back on. I'm always excited to be here, Shay. And man, I think it might be maybe 10 times since I've been on, but you know, maybe time so. just flies. So you just lose track. <laughs> I know it's probably been more than four or five now that I think about it, but like, I feel like each one keeps getting better. And also side note, like whenever you come on, like the people, the people love it. Like we get lots of, lots of um, good feedback and, and views and everything. So, and I think this one will be no different. So I want to kind of start off with um, kind of how you start off the article, right? Where you start off saying like uh, that right now we're blaming a lot of the wrong things for ACL injuries. And you, I think you said there was what, was it 20 ACL injuries in the last, in what, 2022 for pro soccer players? Yes, I think where we currently are, where we are in July 2023, right before the World Cup starts. And I think it's a little bit more than that. But yes, around 20 this year in uh, women's professional soccer. Right. And, and I mean, in the past, and even when I tore my ACL, and I remember doing a research paper on this in college, the reason why girls tore their ACL more often was because of the, our anatomy, right? It was always like the knee valgus thing. Like that was always the thing. And maybe it still is a factor, but um, you get into the article really stating that like, we're, we're just trying to pinpoint it on one thing. And that's not really the case that mo- the injury is multifactorial. So um, I, I'd love to hear you talk about that statement a little bit, how injury risk is multifactorial. What does that mean? And just in the grand scheme of things, let's kind of dive into that there. I do want to twist this topic on your audience and just give an analogy. So say someone in your family gets cancer. We try to find like what the cause of that was, and we never can find a single cause. It could be genetic. It could be all the factors involved in their lifestyle. It could be bad luck. It could be a multitude of those things. And that goes with with anything in life, whether it's cancer, sickness, disease, getting a virus or getting injured. So we have to really look at all factors. And what's going on now is a lot of people are pointing the blame at usually like one to three things. Currently, I keep hearing over and over again. So The first one you mentioned is a lot of people are blaming, oh, well, it's the female anatomy. And this is a really dangerous factor to just blast at our young girls because they're always going to have the female anatomy. They can't really change their hip structure and how their bones are. We can't change that they have a menstrual cycle. They've always had menstrual cycles. So those are things they can't really control. But the narrative is this fear mongering, oh, well, you're a girl and and you're more likely. And while there are some studies that say that, yes, females might be more likely compared to males, the factor that is more dominating than the female factor in ACL risk is controllable factors like our training, our nutrition, low management and recovery, which we will get into. So we can't just blame the female factor because it's really disempowering for our girls. It's something they can't control. And we want to, at the end of the day, empower them and practice true girls empowerment. I'm sure everyone's on board with that. And then the, the second factor I hear a lot of is, well, there's not enough resources in the women's game. And I get sent articles from my friends all the time who are not in the industry. I just got an article texted to me the other day about why women's players are tearing their ACLs. And the one reason the article said it was happening was because of a lack of resources in the women's game. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but laugh because again, we're blaming a single factor. It's very unscientific. We can't, we can't prove that either. And also I just laugh because the U S women's soccer team has the top sports science staff in the world. They have the best GPS technology in the world. They have the best facilities in the world, but I'd also argue, well, 
if you feel like you need more money to prevent ACL injuries, then what's that money going to do for you? Is more technology really the answer or should we return back to basics and focus on, on the big rocks? And that's your training, nutrition and, and recovery, but also some things that go on in the youth system as well that we could be working on. So yeah. it's just frustrating to see because it holds girls back more. It, it, it brings us back to where we started, just this victim mindset, this complaining when there is tons of proven research on the benefits of strength training and plyometric mm -hmm. training and load management and recovery. And that's another big misconception is there's not enough research done in the female athlete population, but there are so many amazing academics when you actually sift through the medical journals and you can go on Google Scholar. There's a lot of free papers on there mm -hmm. and you'll see that there's so many great academics studying the female athlete across all sports, soccer, field yeah. hockey, softball, uh, ballet, gymnastics, like every single sport. So we have gotten more research in this population. Mm -hmm. Of course, sure. we could always use more as women's sports continue to grow. And I think that's going to organically happen. We just have more research because the women's game is just getting better and more people are getting into that field. But <laughs> we have enough research at this point to start taking action with our training and other controllable factors. Yeah. And I just want to kind of echo and agree that, that even, you know, as a youth athlete growing up, it was always just like, yeah, you're probably going to tear your ACL if you're a female athlete. And like, how, how terrible is that? Like, if we think we're going to tear ACL and we have that mindset, yeah, it's probably going to happen. And so it really is, is really disempowering. And it's like, we, it was something that um, you almost thought you had no control over. You, you could maybe strength train a little bit, but still, even if, if you did that, you were still probably going to tear your ACL. And it was very, and still is uh, very disempowering and like, just not, you know, taking that personal responsibility. And so I, I love this article for the reason, and we'll get into the specifics, you know, the, the actionable items and controllables. But I, I think that's one of the biggest take homes that I want people to get from this is that, you know, like it's not linear. It's not that just one thing causes the other thing. It's like the relationship between all of the factors is what causes it. And so it's time to kind of number one, take back the power. Um, and we'll talk about how you can do that. But number two, realize that it's never just one single cause um, to, you know, any injury or any sickness, like you said, whether it's an injury or a sickness or a cancer, or whatever it is, like there's always so many factors and can't just be boiled down to one thing. So with that being said, um, I know you have, I think it was four things, uh, in that article that you talked about kind of those actionable steps. So let's dive into the first one, which is physical literacy. So this is obviously a big one. I mean, they're all big ones. Um, but talk a little bit about what physical literacy is um, and what parents and both athletes can do to improve this, to, you know, take action on it. This is a really important one because we are starting to see in the past decade, the result of the early specialization model, the year round travel soccer model for the younger ages. And when we look at how the ACL injuries have increased in the past decade, we can look at this, okay, well, this seems like a common denominator is that introduction of early specialization. It's so interesting because even though we've had more access to GPS sensors, there's actually more young girls getting into performance facilities and actually getting into the gym more than in the 90s. We didn't really have strength coaches in the 90s. But what's going on here? Oh, okay. Well, maybe we should consider early specialization and its dangers. So again, this is another factor where there is a wealth of research behind it and why early specialization is very dangerous for any female athlete younger than age 12, age 11. During ages eight to 12 is really that time for 
a female athlete to get exposed to different environments where she can build a very sturdy foundation of movement skills. So that's what physical literacy means essentially is just building motor skills to be able to move the body well, be coordinated, have balance, have good body awareness in space and be able to react to stimuli. And that's really what's transferable to soccer and to our sports is being able to react quickly. And it's so important for girls to get exposure to those movements and build different muscle groups, because if they're doing soccer, 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 since age eight, Mm -hmm. pretty much over eight months of the year, that's usually the average of what most of these girls are doing. They're overusing a lot of muscles in the, the quadriceps and also the hip flexor, and that's causing an imbalance and their knees are not as stable because they're lacking in uh, upper body strength, just overall control of their core and trunk area. And they're really lacking in that hamstring strength, especially if they're not strength training. And we'll get into that next factor. The specialization is just really overusing a lot of muscle groups. And I think a lot of people are under the impression, well, if my my girl specializes early, she's going to get ahead and she's going to become a soccer star. But in the end, if you give that exposure to her with a variety of environments and you build all muscle groups in the body, including the upper body, she's going to be a well-rounded athlete so that later in high school and in college, she can have a healthy career, but she'll also improve her performance as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's not just like better for injuries, but just to learn how to move as a human being, like you're going to need movement for the rest of your life. If you don't have movement, you really don't have anything else. So to like, not just focus on, oh, they just need to be a good soccer player. Like, no, they need to learn how to move in various different ways, I think is so important. Like, yes, for the short term, but also more importantly, like for the long term, not just their career, but even like after they're done playing sports. Right. So with early or sorry, with uh, physical literacy, like one of the pieces is don't specialize, but also like, what are some things they can do kind of like just at home um, in their own training to kind of develop this? Do movements that they're not doing in their main sport. Some of the basic motor skills that kids should have mastered is how to throw, how to catch, how to gallop, skip, leap, crawl, climb, roll, and all these movements build great core strength, great upper body strength. And yes, you need these for soccer because if you don't have strength and control in your upper body, there's going to be a breakdown in the lower body and more instability in the ankles and in the knees too. So it's really important to give the whole body love and to just build the complete human. Yeah, I think a lot of, and we maybe get into this with the strength training, but I think a lot of people think, okay, I play soccer or my daughter plays soccer. And so we're just, we need to just build the legs and the core. Like, it's like, no, it's the whole body. Like you can't neglect the one part of the body or only work on one part of the body. Like it just doesn't work like that. So I think that's huge. It's like all the things you said, it's like, how do you go do that? Go play, go climb a tree, go play tag, go play on the playground. Like just go essentially like go be a kid and just move. Right. I agree. And I think that movement piece and the physical benefits of a variety of movement is so key, but also the mental benefits to this. Mm -hmm. So kids to have a variety of movement in their youth, they're, they're more creative. They have emotional intelligence and there's a lot of studies on this. And Dr. Mm -hmm. John Rady is one of my favorites and also Renee Vormhunt, hopefully I didn't butcher his name, but uh, he works with the Dutch FA and he wrote the book, the athletic skills model. And I get more excited about the brain development that's happening in kids. So that's a really good book that parents should check out. And we need our brains to play our primary sport. So what better way to do different games and activities and just like spontaneous things to really transfer that to the spontaneity and the decision-making in your sport. So the brain component's really big for me and also just giving them a break from that mental burnout. I am in this every day. I I've been doing this for 12 years and, you know, I'm not saying that to both, but I'm just saying that I see these things happening on a daily basis with really young kids. I have seen 
eight to 12 year olds be burned out. And I get really confused because I'm like, wait, that's like your prime. You should be like bursting with energy all the time and waking up with joy. But what are these eight to 12 year olds doing year round? They're doing travel soccer and that even blasts through the entire summer. And I see it. I see them even showing up to my sessions, which, you know, we play like dodgeball and we do different things. Sometimes I see them showing up mentally burned out because over a weekend in the summer, they had a tournament of six games. So that mental rest is really important for the kids too. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. We could probably do a whole podcast on this specific topic, but let's move on to (laughs) the second one, which is year round strength. So um, I saw a quote in there that it says ACL injuries can be reduced by over 60% if girls strength train consistently. Like that's huge, 60%, right? And I think the key word there too is consistently. Um, so talk a little bit about year-round strength. Uh, what does that look like? And what are some of the like main principles for strength training? I can keep this one very brief because it's, it's common sense at this point. If you're not strength training, then I think you've lived in a cave, (laughs) but this one is, I would say the most research in the female population. And one of my favorite ACL researchers, I've had him on my podcast, Dr. Tim Hewitt. I mean, the guy has written over like 200 publications or has been involved in them on this research. Like he's dedicated his life to this. And he said that within that research that they can reduce it by over 60% by strength training. But he said they must be continuing the strength training year round. So it has to be periodized based on in season or off season. And it's better than nothing to train in the off season and get strong for a couple months. But If that's not continued in season, that's when it gets a little bit sketchy because then the sport load from soccer is higher than the tolerance of the muscles because the muscles at that point are starting to wither away because they're not given a strength stimulus to maintain their strength and even to continue to get stronger in season. You can still continue to get stronger. You just have to be smart about it and just keeping the reps low. You can up the intensity a little bit and not have girls be sore from strength training, but it's really important that they do it consistently and not just for a couple months time and then peace out. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, as far as like what to do, it's like, don't, don't overcomplicate it. You don't need all this fancy equipment. You don't need to go to a gym. Like I haven't gone to a gym in years. I do everything like out in my backyard with a couple pieces of equipment, like keep it simple. Um, go look at Erica's YouTube. If you're like, well, what should I do? Like, please don't go to Instagram and just look at some random like thing, like go to someone who knows what they're doing, who works specifically with female athletes and Erica and Erica, all your stuff. It's like, it's like just basic human movements. Like we're not overcomplicating it. Um, and we're working, we're not just working the quads and the hamstrings and the calves. It's like, it's all of it. It's all like one system. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that in there too. Cause I know there's people that are like, well, I don't know what to do. And like, that's fine. But like you have, Erica has so many free resources that you can check out as far as that goes, even in this article. And we'll link the article. Like you have a ton of videos of different kinds of movements and stuff. And I I like what you said there that you go out and you just have a couple pieces of equipment and you get outside. Oh, my light turns off. That's okay. (laughs) And you get outside and you load your body gradually over time. You give it a new stimulus. That's why I just kind of laugh at the we need more funding argument. It's like you don't need to be a millionaire and to have so much money in your bank account to be able to strength train and load. If I can suggest anything to do for free, is just buy or well, not free, but get a power block because that lasts longer and you can change the weight on it. You can get on Amazon and that's fairly cost-effective, but a free workout, and this is the best strength training you can do is sprint. It's one of the best hamstring strengthening exercises you can do, which helps stabilize the knee, but also you'll get faster by doing sprints daily. So yeah, just really sprint, get outside and play and just load with some weights. You you don't even need me. Just use the videos in the article. Right. And the thing is too, like you don't technically even need like a dumbbell or a kettlebell. Like when I go to the beach, I'll go pick up rocks and I bring them home. I can look at my window and see my rocks out there. You can get a bucket and you can put uh, some rocks in it, some dirt in it, some water in it. Like, yes, it's, it's nice to have some dumbbells and stuff for certain things, but like, you don't absolutely 
need all that stuff. Like you can get creative and like use what's around you to, to load as well. Um, and just like up the intensity and there's different things you can do to, to change loads and stuff like that. Absolutely. And you know, if you have the, the budget to invest in a performance coach, then sure. I absolutely recommend that because they can really progress the sets and reps around the in-season and off-season season yeah. schedule and really help with that load management. So I would say like most people who listen to this podcast are playing travel soccer. So they're investing a lot anyway, but like really think about, okay, well, what's important and what's important to invest in for the health of my dog. So it's just something to consider. I don't think strength training should be seen as this, like, oh, you get extra credit if you do it. It's no it's necessary. It's a, it's a non-negotiable based on the research. Yeah. Like if anyone comes to me, Hey Shay, should I uh, invest in my daughter to do some private training or strength training? hundred percent of the time strength training or, uh, you know, and a mental training, I would obviously put in there too, over private training, but yeah, it's, it's not a, like an, an afterthought or it shouldn't be an afterthought. It, it, it just like, we've seen the research, read the article, listen to the podcast. Um, and then with that said, you mentioned load management. Um, so number three is load management. So, um, give us a little, a little spiel on that, what that means, how we can, you know, focus on that. Load management is a very confusing topic for a lot of people. And I think there's this big misconception that it's decreasing playing time during the season or just giving extra off days, which that can be a part of it, but I think it's a sliver of the load management puzzle. So if we are doing load management properly, that means we are looking at just the macro picture of the whole year. What months or what season is it go time? Is it fall? Is it spring? And then what seasons do we take a break from sport load and we give our bodies time to rest for a few weeks. And then we give our bodies a new stimulus in that off season to slowly build up again, to slowly build up endurance and conditioning capacity, and then strength and speed while taking a break from games, because you can't gain a lot of these physical capabilities like speed, strength, and conditioning. If you're not taking off from games, because you're going to be too burnt out at that point to get a really good adaptation. So load management is really looking at the macro picture first and being like, okay, when can my daughter have a true off season? Does she need to do an extra league in the summer? Or can we actually use that time to really build her up as a healthy athlete? Yeah. And what would you recommend? Like, I don't know if there is a one answer, right answer to this, but what would you recommend as far as length of time for like an off season? So to say, I would say at a minimum two months, I I honestly would prefer I have three months. And I had that with most of my athletes this summer, just because in that first month, I kind of want to take a little bit of a chill (laughs) session. Like we're right. not going really hard in our conditioning right out the gates in an off season program. We're learning the strength movements. We're doing light load. So we're just kind of like taking a break from like really low impact activities as well. And then in month two, we start to ramp it up by increasing volume. So adding more reps in the gym, adding more reps in our conditioning And then in month three, after we've built that capacity, we start to make it more sports specific, the closer we get to preseason. So Mm -hmm. right now my athletes are like two weeks out from preseason and we're doing the hardest conditioning possible. We're doing shuttle runs, heavy change of direction and very short rest in our conditioning drills. And we're also very speed and power focused at the moment. So there's definitely phases within that smaller cycle to really build up their their tolerance to handle those loads and to be ready for preseason. And I'm thinking like, there's probably not very many people out there that take two to in the youth game that take two to three months off. And I'm thinking, okay, if I'm a parent right now, what, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, how am I supposed to take two to three months off when the coach has practices or tournaments or we got camps? Like a lot of my girls are doing camps and stuff like that. And so, I mean, how much of it is even in the, parents control when they think a hey, I the coach is doing this and so I think it's it's not necessarily it's all the parents or it's all the coaches I think it's both that need to be aware and change but yeah I guess just from the role of a parent like 
how would, how, what advice would you give them to like, maybe get some of that time back, even when perhaps there is some stuff scheduled over the summer or winter? Well, I would want them to ask, okay, well, what do you want your daughter to improve in the summer? If it's speed, then we can't get the best speed adaptation we want. If a girl is showing up to speed training tired for sure. And I I tell my own athletes, if you have a Sunday game from a summer league, don't you dare show up to my Monday speed session because you're not going to get anything out of it because a speed session requires max output and max exertion on every single sprint that we do. So it's really important to be as fresh as possible for those sessions. If you can kind of work your schedule around that, if that's your goal, Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to strength train like during all this, but the sets and reps again would have to be like very carefully planned. So I know it's hard, but I think people just need to come back to, okay, well, what, physical qualities do I really want to improve and what am I willing to give up in my schedule to be able to accomplish that? Yeah. I mean, the simple question is like, what's going to be the best decision for my daughter. Right. And then, and then go from there. So yeah, that's, I know that's a hard thing for a lot of parents because they, I think a lot of them understand that it's good for them to take breaks. Um, but then it's like the coach, it's not necessarily like conducive to that. And then the other thing too, is like, in my opinion, Summer and winter, it should be a, one of the top priorities should be fun, relaxation, vacation. Like it doesn't always have to be, we always need to be getting better at something. Like, can we just like enjoy life at the same time? You know what I mean? So that's, that's important too, obviously. Um, and then the last one is, you know, there's a couple things here, but it's really like the nutrition, the sleep recovery, uh, menstrual cycle. So I know there's a lot we can get into here, but let's just go kind of like, you know, 10,000 foot overview on, on these and, and why they matter for, you know, ACL prevention. The nutrition one is one that's really frustrating to see because, a lot of female athletes get it wrong because they're highly deficient in protein and omega-3 fatty acids. These two are critical for muscle recovery and also building muscle strength. So protein is big on that. And a lot of girls are getting, gosh, like 10 to 15 grams per meal when most people are recommending, Hey, you should be getting at minimum 20 grams a meal. If not bumping that up to 30 grams a meal to really speed up your recovery and make sure your muscles are building and they're not in chronic soreness all the time. So that protein part is really key. And then The omega-3s are really critical for just normal menstrual cycle function. And this is another uncontrollable factor that a lot of people are blaming on ACL injuries. And it's like, well, females have always had menstrual cycles. That's not going to change. So our best bet is to make sure we have healthy menstrual cycles and we have healthy hormonal balance and we don't have too much estrogen or too much testosterone and not enough progesterone. That's usually PCOS. A lot of young teenage girls suffer from that because they're too dominant in estrogen that can lead to things like fatigue or just decreased recovery or sleep issues or missed periods or weight gain in the sense of like, um, not muscle, but just excess fat and water retention, which is not good for our female athletes, because not only is that going to hinder performance, but mentally that's going to get to them. Yeah, totally. So the omega-3 fatty acids are amazing for that. Usually that week before the period starts, when you start to feel a little bit off and you might have extra fatigue or maybe some bloating and pain, which by the way is not normal. But if you're getting omega-3s, you're actually reducing the inflammatory response in the body and you're able to feel a lot better during that time. And that's usually the luteal phase going into the menstrual phase in, in female athletes. So that's our best bet is making sure we're getting good protein and omega-3s. And if we're nailing those two down first, then a lot of female athletes are going to find that they feel a lot better. They feel that their uh, menstrual cycle is just more regular and they don't have these negative symptoms that come with it that can increase injury risk. Okay. Beautiful. And then like a touch a little bit on the most important recovery tool, uh, which is sleep and then any other recovery there that's important. 
Well, there's a reason it's called beauty sleep. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, what sleep does is it just heals your body. (laughs) And what what more beautiful thing than that? So during sleep, our, our muscles heal all of the micro injuries we got during training that day or during a game that day, we repair all those injuries during sleep. And then we also allow our brain to heal and to clean itself as well. And we need that for performance because we have to make decisions. We have to have energy and focus. So sleep is my number one for recovery alongside with nutrition. So that's like the, the base of the recovery pyramid. And then the rest is like, you know, like cold therapy and all that, but you got to get your sleep and nutrition down because sleep, sleep deprivation increases ACL risk. There's a lot of studies on that as well. And then just a lack of fueling and good uh, muscle recovery through protein also can increase the, the risk of injury. Yeah. I mean, sleep too. It's like, there's been so many studies done just with like students and, you know, one group has gets sleep, one group doesn't and how differently they perform on a test. And just like, even with like, I, I'm working with a girl who, um, we're really focusing on motivation and it's like the, the number one thing getting in the way of the motivation is her energy is her sleep. And so if you, if you don't have sleep, like you, you can't perform and function as a human being, let alone an athlete who's, you know, putting all this load on their body. So, um, sleep, 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 beauty, get your beauty sleep. Um, so Erica, um, is there anything else, um, that we didn't really touch on in the article, um, or outside of the article that's relevant for this, that, that you want to share with the load management part, it's really important to not just play year round because, we are constantly in that catabolic state and our muscles are constantly breaking down that entire time. So we do need a couple months period where we chill out. uh, We don't load the joints and we don't do all that muscle output all the time. It's similar to saying, okay, like you're a marathoner, train for a marathon year round and have no (laughs) periodization. Just keep going. That, that runner is going to destroy their body. And it's the same for soccer. I mean, most soccer players in a game, if you play the full 90, you're running anywhere from usually like four to six miles in the girls and, and the women's game, maybe a little bit more, but it's a lot. It is a lot on the body and it's a lot on female hormones. And I might need to come back on to discuss this, but it really, raises cortisol and it's also not good for our adrenals. So female athletes do need a a period of recovery to really help with that hormonal balance, because not only is that bad for ACL risk, it's just bad for overall health. Yeah. Mental health too. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even get there yet, but (laughs) we'll do a part two. (laughs) I know for real. Yeah. It's, it's like everything there. So it's like parents that are listening Like, just take a look, like Erica said, look at the macro, look at the whole schedule for the year and figure out where can we get two to three months. Um, And and this is actually a good question, Erica. Um, These two to three months, should they be together or should we, or, or could it be a month in the summer, a month in the winter, or would that not really serve the purpose there? They should be consecutive. And I get this question a lot, but they need to be consecutive because we want to be consecutive and consistent with that progression in the off season. So so like the deload and then the coming back up. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the deload and then building up capacity in the next month and then focusing on increasing intensity and speed and power. It has to be just a nice consecutive progression because if you take a month off, you can't really accomplish a lot from a speed, right. strength and conditioning perspective. Right. Um, and you, and if you rush into that month and try to do as much as you can in that month, then that also increases injury risk. So awesome. you want these to be consecutive. Yeah. Cause I could see, right. If you completely take it off, you're obviously not going to get faster, stronger there, but if you just use that one month to try to get faster, stronger, you like you haven't had the proper like deload there. So that, that makes sense. So I'm, I'm glad I asked that question. So find two to three consecutive months in your schedule. If you're, if your daughter has like, you know, tournaments or practices, like just have a conversation with the coach. And at the end of the day, what's the most important thing for your daughter, figure that out and then make it work. Beautiful. 
So Erica, um, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to link uh, the article and then also will you just, I, I always want to give you a, a, some space to kind of share how you can personally help the, the girls and families listening. So um, should just share a little bit about what you have and, and for those that really want to have the mentorship and support in this area, where can they learn more about that? Sure. So I'm hanging out mainly on Twitter at fit soccer queen, and I post a lot of workout videos on there as well. But if you want more of a program, I would actually start with the book because cool. there's a lot of movements in there. You can just do at home and you can just get a few pieces of equipment and it's super time efficient and cost effective to do it at home. So start with the book first. And then yep. if you want more like weekly accountability, I do have my speed Queens remote program, which is a year round periodized speed and strength program and load management program. I love that. And the book for those of you that aren't watching on YouTube is the strong female athlete book, um, on Amazon, right? We'll, we'll yes. link on Amazon. Cool. And we'll get that there. So yeah, number one, go check out the book, um, read the article and just check out Erica's stuff. But yeah, thanks again for coming on Erica. We'll probably have another longer uh, conversation perhaps around load, load management and hormones and stuff sometime. Um, but I appreciate you coming on and always sharing the awesome things you have to share. Thank you, Shay. Always a pleasure.